Well, I want to welcome to the program Dr. Taylor Marshall joining me today. Hey, welcome. Hey, good to be here. Thanks. So, Dr. Dr. Marshall, I, I I love having the chance to talk with you for several reasons. First of all, you're the you're a husband to Joy, a father of eight children, and uh, you're a Catholic philosopher who is uh, a great uh, lover promoter of Saint Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you have no idea Amen. how much that connects to my own life. I uh, I'm the uh, husband to Kerry, a father of nine children. Oh, you got me beat. I got to get to work. <laughs> well, you know what? Is there any beating, right? This is a, aren't children yeah. such a gift, right? Like just yeah. such a gift from God. A gift, a gift. Yeah, especially yes. we're recording this on All Saints Day. So like that's as fathers, that's our prayer for our kids, that they'll be all saints. Well, amen to that. In, this is a, I think it's a great day to talk about a theme that is painful, a theme that is uh, a great challenge, I think, for many, many Catholics. I know that, and the reason why I'm having you on the program today is not only to have you be another voice that has been focused on, uh, reflecting upon, and, and helping to bring to Catholics a lady and, and so many others here in the U.S. and beyond, insight into what is going on in the church, what is happening in this, what everyone's calling a crisis. Uh, so first of all, let me just, uh, I'm going to, I want to point people to your websites. Uh, taylormarshall.com is going to be a, a first place to help folks understand who you are, get to know more about you and about the important work you're doing. But I also want to make sure that uh, as we go on, we talk about the new St. Thomas.com, the new St. Thomas Institute found at NewStThomas.com, where you are uh, doing so much to help the, the great teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas be accessible today, and even beyond that, to so many other things as well. So we're going to have a chance to, to discuss some of that. But the first reason why I'm having you on is really around this, this crisis in the church. What was it that made you feel a sense of uh, a drive, an inner impulse to say, I've got to talk about this? You know, I think if we, if we step back and just take a look at the meta narrative, like the bird's eye, heaven, heavenly view and say, what is Christ's intention for humanity, for the church, for salvation? And that is to share the relationship between the eternal father and the son, right? And that, that relationship is cemented together, as Thomas Aquinas would say, in the person of the Holy Spirit. So ultimately, reality, our salvation, our purpose in life is to reflect that beautiful relationship, this eternal love between the Father who eternally generates the Son, His only begotten Son, in the Holy Spirit. And so if that's the intention for all of mankind, that's the intention for the church, that's the intention for the priesthood, that's the intention for baptism, for faith, you can also see from the reverse side of the coin if you're the devil, if you're the demons, what is your number one goal? And that is to obstruct and obscure and, and disease a relationship between the father and the son. So if we're coming at it from that perspective, this crisis, whatever we call it, makes a lot of sense. And that is how do we, if you're demonic, if you have a demonic mind, how do we perfectly corrupt the Trinity's plan for mankind, for the church? for the priesthood, for baptism, for all, all seven sacraments. And that is to introduce not only doctrinal confusion, but moral and sexual confusion for those men who are ontologically spiritual fathers, who are supposed to be providing uh, the grace and the, and the love and the mercy, the nurture to foster this father-son relationship, to enter us into that Trinitarian reality of love. So. That's what's going on. And if you understand that, you see how deeply sad and demonic this whole thing is because the, this is souls on the line. This is, this is the number one purpose for Christ's incarnation, his death on the cross, his resurrection, sending the Holy Spirit. All of this is so that we enter into this reality. So it's not like there was a moment where I said, wow, I've got to say something about this. It's just as a Catholic, as a father, uh, seeing this from a theological point of view, we have to do something. This is, again, one of the greatest crises in the church. And I, I honestly do think we are at the level, perhaps exceeding the level of the Aryan crisis in the fourth century. This is becoming such a, uh, not only a theological problem, 
but a moral problem obscuring the entire purpose of Christianity. I'm talking today with Dr. Taylor Marshall. Uh, Dr. Marshall, you you talk about this idea that this crisis is that large. And I, part of what I wonder is this, is that here you are talking about this regularly and exploring different aspects as it continues to unfold. I'm doing the same thing out here on the radio and when I go and I give talks. And it's like, is part of the reason why this crisis continues in the way it is, is that there are not enough voices of the shepherds. There are not enough voices from those whom the Lord has established to govern, teach, and sanctify us uh, as, as our Holy Father, as the bishops around the world. If we heard more from them, I feel like I could do less <laughs> in terms of the messaging that I'm bringing. Uh, I, what do you think about that? It's, it's tragic, but if we look at church history, it's usual. We see this over and over again that our Lord usually chooses the peasant, the poor, often the lay, often the female, going all the way back to the first Easter, actually back to Good Friday. You know, John the Apostle's there, but the other 11 apostles are absent. And the ones that are there with the greatest devotion are, of course, John, but Mary Magdalene, the women, of course, the mother of God. And in every age, you know, you see apparitions like Fatima, you know, our lady is coming and she's not calling the Bishop of Portugal or the Pope. She's calling three little kids. You know, you look at the great evangelization of, of Mexico in Central America, it's Juan Diego, a peasant, you know, a convert peasant, you know, from the Aztec people. And the bishop's like, who are you? You know, come back when you have a miracle. Like this is, you know, you're just a peasant. And he comes back with the tilma and the roses. So it's almost in our Lord's design, in his purpose, to use people who are kind of outside the, the clerical office that he established. I'm not discounting apostolic succession, the papacy, cardinals, all of that is part of his plan. But it seems like when, when big things happen in the church, even with his first appearance at the resurrection, he appears to Mary Magdalene, says, hey, go get the 12. For some reason, our Lord likes to work this way. And so we're not hearing, you know, the majority of the bishops or, or the cardinals speak on this at all. No surprise. I, I, we've seen this over and over. St. Jerome says that in the Arian crisis, the world groaned and woke to find herself Arian. And most of the bishops were Arian. Well, it's a, uh, yeah. And for me, it's like, I expected more. I expected better. And I think the, the people of God, you know, the, the, the church uh, of Jesus Christ deserves more from her God ad- ordained and assigned leaders. I think about the, the change though, for, for at least for me, and, I, and you've gone through this a couple of times, you've, you were ordained as an Episcopalian priest and all of a sudden, wait a minute, I, if I'm going to be faithful to the Lord, it means a different path. Yes. And when I think about, the messaging that I've been bringing uh, in the different ways that God has given me opportunities to, to speak. Uh, I, I love to be relentlessly positive, <laughs> proclaim Jesus Christ and it's good news. And it's about life and freedom and joy, but it's freedom from sin. That's it's right. joy through the cross. It is dying to self. It is about resurrection comes through death. And sometimes we have to draw attention to this other side of things. And if there's sin, we need to call it forth. We need to uh, identify what it is if we're going to, in fact, be set free from it. Uh, in fact, was it a, a Aquinas who said, uh, you know, what is not revealed can't be healed, right? If there's a, if there's a sin and it stays hidden, how is it going to be addressed? It has yeah. to come out into the open. And yeah, how, how can the doctor cut out the cancer if he doesn't see the cancer? Yeah, and if you have a sick patient go into the doctor's office and the doctor says, what's wrong? He says, I'm not telling. You know, I'm just going to stay silent. I will say not a word. I'll say not a word. Yeah. Well, how's that going to be addressed? So my sense is that uh, what, what worked before August 22nd or, or at the end of June when the Archbishop McCarrick uh, revelation came out, uh, became public, not that it wasn't known, but it now became public in a whole new way. Something changed. It was like the, I felt uh, uh, that the call that was asked of me was not the same as Juan Diego walking and all of a sudden the Blessed Mother breaks in or the, uh, you know, the, the three children of Fatima, the same thing. But I feel like there's a, there's a new moment 
and it requires something different from us. Are you sensing that same thing? I do. I mean, I've taught seminarians for a number of years. Uh, I've taught them in Rome. Um, I've been close to a number of bishops, and I have known that something is rotten for, not to this extent that we found out in the last few months, but I've known there's something rotten in the seminary life and and in the life of certain bishops. And that was always a great sorrow in my heart. And it was something I could never discuss. I would never have gone on the radio or on a video and discussed it. I just kind of felt, well, like, you know, Noah's sons, I'll just turn my back and, and put the blanket over it. And so when these things came out, beginning with McCarrick, and then also with the grand jury report from Pennsylvania, in a certain sense, it was a big relief for me because I've often, because I've heard so often people say, well, the next generation of priests, they're all Orthodox, the John Paul II generation, just, you know, all these, you know, 1970s uh, priests and bishops are going to die out. And we're going to have this great. And I knew in my spirit that that was not true. Because I've been around the seminaries. I've been around and I've seen that the, over time, through the curriculum, through the textbooks, through the professors, they have recreated a new generation that are in the priesthood. Yeah, so I'd be at Catholic conferences and I'd hear this repeated, you know, that all of our new priests are coming up are so strong and so orthodox and traditional, all that. And I knew in my, my soul that that wasn't exactly correct. And I didn't want to be the party pooper because in the seminaries, through the curriculum and the books and all of this, they have duplicated themselves. They have excluded Orthodox men. I know some of them. And they have included men who should have been vetted. They, these men have no business being in the priesthood. So now that these revelations have come out, and we've seen what's been going on with McCarrick and his seminarians and the grand jury report, and you know, I could list more and more dioceses globally, the lay people are realizing, oh, no, it wasn't just a problem back in the 60s and the 70s. It's a problem now. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, the, and there are good sadness. men and there are good men and good story, uh, good men with with stories of being excluded from priestly formation all over. Yep. So, um, it's a very sad tale. And it's something that I know is it, these stories are coming to me as I talk about this. Yes. It's almost as if you give it gives some people permission. I know that it has given victim survivors permission to come to me and say, thank you for talking about this. We felt like we've never had a voice. We don't have any space to be able to be heard, to be received. And, and they're in a situation of trauma. And I think that this is one of the aspects of the, of the issue that when people draw close to the victim survivors, to the victim survivors, then they change. They experience a conversion. And, and doesn't that make sense? You know, in the gospel, where does Jesus prefer to be with? The poor, the outcasts, the sinners, the prostitutes, the, those whom the, the, the officials seem to stay away from because they don't want to be dirty. Right. Uh, all of a sudden now, when you draw close to them, it changes. There, there's where true mercy, compassion. Yes. Uh, I feel like the victims are the 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 one rock walking on the road who gets beaten up in the in the Gospel of Luke, the Good Samaritan story, and it's like you want to walk by. It's too scary to be near that one. Yeah. Rather than being the Good Samaritan who actually draws near to those who are traumatized, and then things change. Yeah. Yeah. And so and what, for for decades now, um, and not all cases, but in a great majority of cases, they've been saying. We'll give you this much money. Will you not talk about it? I mean, yeah. that's, that's not paternal. We don't, as, as fathers of your nine children, my eight kids, I don't say that. <laughs> like, here's, here's 20 bucks. Let's get over it. That's yep. not how you deal with problems. So I went back and someone had sent me a link to a frontline. It was a PBS produced documentary on secrets of the Vatican. And it was so disturbing it was four years ago. It was uh, published in 2014. So a year after um, Pope Francis, our Holy Father, was raised to the, uh, to the, to the role of being Pope. And uh, it goes into the crisis at that time. You know, it goes into the, right. the red book that was given to uh, uh, Pope Benedict XVI and, and how it ended up probably being deeply influential on his decision to resign the papacy. And 
you hear this four years ago, uh, Archbishop Vigano, they mentioned him and what he did at the Vatican, uh, the Vatican Bank, and then the Vata Leaks. And it goes on. And I'm like, wow, this was out there through the secular media four years ago. And you think of all the ways that the world is correcting the church. Rather than the church moving the world, yeah. it's the world correcting the church. There's something wrong with that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting that the whole, the story of Vigano doesn't just begin with this. It goes all the way back to the Vatican Bank scandals long ago, back in the pontificate of, of Pope Benedict XVI, and people were aware of this. And honestly, it's my conviction that Pope Benedict XVI sent Vigano to Washington, D.C. as nuncio, not to demote him not because he was upset with him, but because he trusted him. You know, Vigano exposed all that corruption in the Vatican Bank. And so I think Benedict knew, okay, here's a guy I can trust. He's going to go and ask questions. He's going to ruffle feathers. Even if cardinals and archbishops get mad at this guy, he's going to give me the truth. He sends him to D.C. and Vigano comes back with, you know, a sack full of, of, of crimes and documentation and all kinds of things. So, yeah, Vigano has been at ground zero for two major Vatican scandals. And I think in my opinion, there are people who differ. That just shows that he's trustworthy. I, I haven't heard that. And that's a great, I think that's a really great insight. I, I'd heard it more as, oh, sending him off to the side and look at how God took and did something with that versus, no, no, no. He was, he was deployed by our Holy Father, Pope Benedict Sixteenth, in order to do that. Yep. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Taylor Marshall, and he's giving us some insight into the, the crisis. Now, when we, we hear about this crisis, we want to find the path out. And I've heard uh, many commentators talk about it's not just a moral crisis, it's also a doctrinal crisis. And this really moves into some of what's at the heart of what your apostolate is all about. So for the folks that are listening on the radio and aren't familiar with the new St. Thomas Institute, talk about why you started that apostolate and what you do through it to help Catholics really be grounded in a, in a foundational way in, in our faith. Well, we've seen a, a crisis in catechesis. Uh, you know, we, many people in our time did not grow up going through a Catholic parochial school system. Those who did did not receive good theological training on, in general, there are exceptions to that. And so we've seen a generation of people who have not received a solid catechesis. Now, there are cer certain ones that went to Barnes & Noble and bought the catechism in the Catholic Church and read it cover to cover, but most of us didn't. And so I was hearing for, for years people saying, how can I learn more? You know, should I go get a master's? How do I grow and become confident as a Catholic and learn about all the riches of our Catholic faith? How do I, you know, start reading the Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas? Um, where should I begin reading the church fathers? You know, is there a Catholic way to read the New Testament? All these questions. And I mean, you can tell someone, okay, well, you know, move to such and such college town and enroll and start taking some courses. But most people, you know, whether you're 18 or 78, are not going to move and enroll themselves in a theological or philosophical program. And so I realized there's a great opportunity here with new media, with the kind of thing we're doing right now, where I could teach courses and bring in other people, and we could do mini courses on Thomas Aquinas, the Church Fathers, um, medieval theology, how to read the Summa. And they'd just be online, and people could get their iPad out and take 10 minute classes for a whole year. And they could do it once a week or five times a week. They could do it fast or slow. And so we started that in 2013. It's been going for over five years now. And I, I, for some reason, I always imagined it would just be Americans, but you know, we now have almost 60 nations in the new St. Thomas Institute, you know, as far away as China and, you know, all over Europe, South America, lots of Africans are getting involved. Cause I realized in some of these nations, there are no seminaries. There are no Catholic colleges. There's no place to go. And we're so, our tuition is so inexpensive that third world peoples can afford to take classes on a weekly, monthly basis. And so it's been very successful. It's, it's very rewarding. We also you know, help with, with orphans and, and feeding the poor. We have that part of our apostolate as well. Um, but you can go in and right now you can take eight uh, curricula. So we have eight certificates, uh, Catholic philosophy and Thomism, Catholic theology, Catholic apologetics, church fathers, medieval theology, modern and reformation, church uh, theology, 
and uh, New Testament studies. And we're just now filming Christ in the Old Testament. So it's an Old Testament curriculum, but looking at Christ and the sacraments and every book of the Old Testament. So kind of an old, a new hidden in the old um, theology. So it's, it's really exciting. It's, uh, it's been a big blessing to be involved in that and have thousands of students all over the world learning theology. And we kind of, we kind of like a, a guarantee that everything's coming from the Bible, ecumenical councils, church fathers, Thomas Aquinas, or the catechism. Like we're not giving you what we think or Taylor Marshall's take on it. Of course, I sometimes share opinions, but I make them know these are opinions. It's like everything we're going to teach you, we're going to give you a citation. This is where it's coming from. Cause we don't want to take our idea. We want to be with the mind of the church. So that's it. New St. Thomas Institute. New St. Thomas.com is the website. New St. Thomas.com. And that's all spelled out. Spell out the word Saint. New yeah, Saint, Saint is spelled Thomas out. Thomas.com. And I'll mention that again at the, uh, at the end of the program. So Taylor, as you have sort of walked with your family through this, uh, one of the questions that my wife Carrie and I have wrestled with is, how much do we talk about this with our kids? Uh, our oldest is 19. Our youngest is six. I've got a couple of boys, 13 and soon to be 12. And they certainly he overhear Carrie yes. and and me talking about these things, and it's like, how much do we say? Look, this is this is what you sign up for, you know. Uh, so, uh, and versus, oh, we know we have to protect their ears from you know being exposed to the fact that there's corruption, there's darkness, there's vile filth, even among the clergy and the bishops. How have you handled that? So our Joy and I originally we decided we would not talk about it with the kids, but that didn't work because they overheard. Uh, they also heard things at school, um, kids bringing things up, and um, and of course, if you listen to Catholic radio in the car, these things are also mentioned. So it's 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 the point where you can't hide it. So then we said, you know, my wife Joy said you need to talk to the older kids, the teenagers. We seem to have like a family meet after rosary one night. We'll send the little ones to bed. And then we'll have a family meeting. We'll just lay it all out. You know, Cardinal McCarrick allegedly did this with these seminarians and this, everything. And just have a talk that not everyone who's a priest is a good man and that they need to know that. And then we also need to say, like, have you ever been uncomfortable around a priest? Like, we have to have that conversation, unfortunately, right? And just because you're with a priest doesn't mean that you're safe. Again, not things we want to, you know, tell our kids, but we have to. So we had the older four with us and we were having this conversation and then about 10 minutes into it i realized that the 10 year old who was not including this meeting he was in another room but i could see him he was listening he wanted to know so i said hey you come in here too so i brought in the 10 year old so i'm 10 and up and we just talked about it and we said that he you know these men took off their clothes you know with seminarians and other priests and they touch people inappropriately and they said well why would a priest want to do that. And I said, well, these are just, these are sick men. It's twisted. This is demonic. This is bad. It's never, and we've had these talks before. It's never okay to touch other people in their private areas ever. You always tell about it and, and anything uncomfortable. And so we just had that talk and it, it actually went well. And they asked a lot of questions and they were interested in it, but they weren't like, um, they weren't scandalized. I thought they might be scandalized. Um, they just listen carefully and ask questions. And we've talked about it a lot since. And my 12 year old has come back to me with a lot of questions because he's obviously thought about it and ruminated on it. And in general, one of the things also relating to New St. Thomas Institute, we try to help parents preserve their children in the church and bring them back. And one of the things that we've heard over and over is being transparent and talking about these issues with your children from a younger age. Some parents who have been successful in having all their kids stay in the faith say we were talk, we were answering their questions and having conversations about what is homosexuality age 10, which is kind of like scandalous to me. But we live in an age where they are bombasted. They're watching any TV. They have friends who have iPhones or whatever. <laughs> They've heard about all this stuff, trans, everything. So the fact that you've had, you know, a hundred conversations with your young person, your adolescent, your teenagers, by the time they go to college, reveals to your child that you're safe to talk to about these issues. Mm -hmm. 
That's, That's a great important. point. It's a Dr. Taylor Marshall talking with me today on the program, and we're discussing the current uh, abuse crisis. And uh, if you've been listening to my programs, I uh, I will talk about it in a way that's somewhat different. I use language, uh, Taylor, that is meant to make things clear. You just talked about transparency, so I pretty much don't say any longer the priest abuse crisis. I'll talk about the. Uh, the sexual violation of teenage boys by active gay priests who are living a lie. And therefore, they're under the domination of the father of lies, the devil. And in doing this, they are assaulting and traumatizing young boys, teenagers, and young adults uh, that have potentially lifelong impact, not only for them, but for their families. Mm. And that's a little different than saying, yeah, it's a pedophilia crisis and we've got it mostly under control. Right. Precisely. And, and it's important too to bring in the the metaphysical, the preternatural, and say, you know, this is demonic. Like we said at the very beginning of this episode, uh, it's it's not just a psychological problem. Um, these men, you know, maybe they didn't receive enough hugs as children or whatever, but these men are in the priesthood and they are preying upon the innocent. They're using the collar, they're using the title, Father, Monsignor, Bishop, in order to gain access to the innocent and to corrupt. So it's very demonic. This is satanic. You know, whether it's explicit, we are worshiping Satan, or in their actions and in the way that they operate and the way that they prey on the innocent, this is satanic. It's a, for me, this is something that I found very striking, that when the initial reports about Archbishop McCarrick came out and then the grand jury report from Pennsylvania, there were so many statements of so many bishops and even our Holy Father that referenced the demonic aspect of this. And it, it's as if I'd never <laughs> seen so many bishops actually talk about the devil, yeah. and talk about the, the spiritual uh, warfare and, and that aspect of things before. Frankly, it was a bit refreshing to be able to hear them talk about a realm of darkness that has personified, you know, they're, they're, they're angelic beings that have fallen and they hate us and they want to destroy us and they want to undermine us and trip us up. And they're involved in this. One of the, one of the things that uh, I gained from your YouTube channel. And I want folks that are listening on the radio, because right now, if this is on YouTube, then you obviously you know it. But for folks that are not aware of your YouTube channel, they can go to taylormarshall.com. They can listen right there. They can watch or they can go to your YouTube channel. Uh, what is your YouTube channel for those who, wa- who are already on that? You go to YouTube and you type in the little search bar there, either Taylor Marshall or Dr. Taylor Marshall, and it'll come up. And there's there's all kinds of videos. I mean, it's not just, I mean, most of the stuff is there is on theology and the Blessed Virgin Mary and, you know, Thomas Aquinas. But I have a couple playlists, if you go into the playlist, that are on the crisis in the church, you know, a dozen or so videos, which are analysis in depth of going line by line through Vigano's first letter, his second one, his third one. Um, responses by certain bishops, analyzing statements by uh, Pope Francis. So a lot of in-depth analysis on the issues, the topics, the statements, everything that's been released. So yeah, just go to YouTube and type in my name, Taylor Marshall, and you'll find a bunch of stuff. One of the things that you bring out in several of those videos in some of the interviews you've done is the, the kind of reversal that sometimes our Holy Father does that I find, find so puzzling when, for instance, People questioned him about Archbishop Vigano's first letter. He said, I won't say a word. And then he comes out and he talks about uh, Jesus was silent and that somehow was now virtuous rather than uh, assenting to an evil. And how um, he is... uh, he is being accused, you know, so that he flips around the whole reality of who's accusing whom right now of wrongdoing. And so there's this reversal of, well, wait a minute now, I'm feeling confused. I feel like you should be speaking here and now you're silent and you're saying somehow silence is a virtue. Or uh, we're, you're talking about fighting against accusers. You're accusing those who are actually questioning you. And, and it was, uh, it's, it's kind of, and then when I heard, you address this in terms of the, some of the political philosophy that under that, that sort of was present uh, in Buenos Aires and in his own cultural background, it was like, wow, is that really what's going on here? 
So would you talk about that a little bit for, for folks who haven't, uh, aren't familiar with that video? Sure. You know, um, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, he comes from Argentina. And um, I don't think it's, ex- it's certainly not exclusive to Argentina. It's not exclusive to a time period. But there is a way of managing people, or you could say doing politics, or organizing uh, a corporation, or even a church, uh, that relates to the, the, what they call Peronism, or Peron, from Argentina. And this was a um, kind of a fascist regime in which uh, the dictator, Perón, he would play both sides. So if he's meeting with a group of conservatives or Catholics, he's a Catholic and a conservative. And if he's meeting with socialists, he tends to have socialists in the room and talks like a socialist. And this allows you to to blend in and to basically have friends in all different areas, right? So it allows someone to manipulate um, a political scene. In America, we're not used to this. I think the Anglo-American approach is very much like, let's square off. We have a two-party system. You know, occasionally you'll see someone who's trying to cross the aisle and be both, but those people tend not to get reelected. They're not very popular in the American scene. So as Americans, we just think, okay, you, you know, we got Republicans and Democrats and conservative liberal, and you don't ever see, you know, a liberal trying to pretend to be conservative for political advantage. It's, it's not really part of our experience, but down south in South America, this is this is uh, a much more common tactic. It's kind of Machiavellian. It's kind of um, you see it. I think a little bit more in Latino culture. I don't know why that is, um, but I think Pope Francis is coming from that background and he's deriving from that background. Plus, mixed into it is he's a Jesuit, and for the past sixty, arguably eighty years the Jesuits have been very busy redefining terms. And, you know, if you go back to the Nouvelle Théologie, which was in many ways a rejection of Thomism in the early 1900s, um, these Nouvelle Théologie uh, theologians would be like um, Balthazar, Rahner, de Lubac, others. They're, they're deeply in the Jesuit formation. And they're using a lot of the same terminology that's used in classical Christian theology, Catholic theology, but they're redefining the terms, grace, regeneration, the transcendent, et cetera. I don't want to get too much into the theology. But both of those factors in Pope Francis, the Jesuit theological formation, which equivocates on theological terms, also the political environment of Perón um, is a strategy of, I'll talk one way, in this audience, I'll talk this way in the other audience because I don't want to polarize. I mean, it, it can be a positive. You know, you don't, when you're at a dinner party with your, if you're a Republican or your Democrat friend, you just don't start, you know, lo- launching in a tirade on Barack Obama or whatever, right? You kind of, okay, I'm going to be cordial. But when you're the Pope and you're the vicar of Christ and you're supposed to be the shepherd of over a billion people who professed Catholic Christianity, can be very confusing. And for the first several years of the pontificate of Pope Francis, I was a defender. I was a reluctant defender, um, but I defended him. I said, well, it could be read this way, or it was a translation error, or I think he was misrepresented, or that quote was taken out of context. You know, we've seen this dozens, hundreds of times with Pope Francis, but it was in 2016, after Amoris Laetitia, really after the dubia by the Dubia brothers, as I call them, were published that I thought, okay, we're now getting too deep. It's too difficult to defend every single thing coming out of Pope Francis's mouth. And I was, I just basically stopped trying to defend. And then once we got into the scandal and I heard, I will not say one word is when I really realized, okay, we as lay people have to say something we have to do something and we need to demand clarity on what's being said. And then if nothing is being said, we need to demand an answer. We have to ask for it. It's if we're in a, if we're in world war two and our men are just getting mowed down and shot and we run over to the captain or the whoever's in charge and say, what do we do now? What's next? And he's like, "Uh, I don't really want to say. Right. You know, it's if you are in a place of high authority, people turn to you and they look for answers. And you even in my own family, if things are bad, 
you know, my wife looks to me and says, what do we do? I don't say, eh, I don't know. Or I don't know. Give me a couple of weeks. I mean, there is time for deliberation, but when bodies are dropping, you know, when souls are on the line, when there's lawsuits and cardinals and bishops dropping and resigning and victims and lies and abuse and payouts, grand jury reports, silence is not an option. Yeah, for me, that's just a fundamental failure of leadership. When I when I see that, uh, you mentioned the the context of being, a, you know, a husband and a father. You are the leader, the provider, the protector for your family. I feel that very deeply. And if there's a threat coming against my family, watch out. Uh, I'm going to be up in arms. I'm going to go on the offensive to do what I can. You know, I'm not going to let my my kids be savaged or ravaged. It would be. Yes. Just it would. There's nothing inside of me that wouldn't say I will give my life for my kids. Yes. If they are being threatened. Yes. Or or even if damaged. They, let's say they're not currently being destroyed or harmed, but there is an imminent threat to them, and they're coming to you and they're saying, "Daddy, what is this and what do we do?" Yeah. Again, it's not acceptable for a father to put his hands in his pockets and not say anything. You yeah. you and I as fathers know this intuitively. It just won't fly. Our wives would never allow us to get away with that. <laughs> right? Absolutely. We yes. have to man up. We have to stand up. We have to have a plan, create a plan. We have to articulate that plan. That's what generals and kings and leaders and popes are called to do. I'm talking today with Dr. Taylor Marshall. He is a Catholic philosopher. He is the founder of the New St. Thomas Institute. Go to newstthomas.com to learn more about the uh, various programs that you can sign up for uh, to go deeper into your own theological formation. Also, taylormarshall.com to be able to access his podcasts, his video interviews, to provide links to the different social media platforms that he's on. Taylor, as as you look forward, here we are. We're a couple weeks away from the uh, meeting of the USCCB, the Bishops' Conference gathering in Baltimore. And uh, unfortunately, when I've talked to certain church leaders around the country, they're like, oh, don't worry. You know, in Baltimore, you know, finally we'll be able to get together and talk about this. And for me, I just feel like, okay, I'm going to be praying for that meeting. I, I am not giving up all hope. But when I look at the signs of what's happening leading up to it, just in terms of voices speaking versus not speaking, I feel like I've seen certain masses of reparation statements and masses that are supposed to be about healing. But too often, I feel like there's still this conspiracy of silence. There is this sense of uh, a lack of really trying to uncover the, the ways in which those who have been hurt need to find healing. Uh, There was a pediatrician who's involved in uh, trauma-informed care. And it it has to do with the way that that trauma uh, lands upon someone who's been victimized in in these sexual violations and these sexual assaults. Uh, And then the path that it requires them to walk on to be able to receive healing. And it seems like if you understand trauma-informed care, that the way that victims are supposed to bring forward and acknowledge abuse, it, 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 that's the first obstacle. It's like, okay, call a phone number and leave a voicemail and say, I've been abused, call me back. That this is not going to lead to healing. That this, and then if you call and you say, well, whatever you do, don't, uh, if you're receiving that call, don't ever give any kind of acknowledgement that there could be actual responsibility here. That could, yeah. there could be some kind of... It's like, if this is how our church leaders are training uh, those who are the front line of being in contact with abuse victims, this is, this is sick and sad, and it's not going to work. And it's not the case everywhere, certainly not. I've talked to some folks that are part of offices of, of youth and child protection, and they do have the, the burning heart of, of the Good Shepherd. But too often, the very processes themselves are all about protecting reputation and protecting financial assets. Yeah, it's it's guided by lawyer protocols, which is unfortunate. And PR, PR, uh, yes. you know, uh, campaigns to to say we we need to be careful. So as you look, you cast your eye to the forward on this All Saints Day when we're recording this. What would you consider to be 
uh, paths uh, that can lead to life for us? Uh, what, would, what would be some of the things that everyone that's listening can do and what we can be bringing to our own church leaders, our pastors, and to our bishops? Well, in my own videos, uh, I've kind of done triage. You've got a group of people out there who are ready to leave the Catholic Church or who have left the Catholic Church on this issue. It might have been in the last few months or it may have been going back to 2003. But their argument is, how could this be the Church of Christ? How could this be the body of Christ? Obviously, it's not. So I need to either give up on Christianity or become Eastern Orthodox or become Protestant. And these people are not few. There are many, many of them. And to them, I would say the church is not the hierarchy. The church is not the cardinal. The church is not the pope. And in the history of the Catholic church, we have seen corrupt ones from Judas all the way up to the present day. So their presence does not invalidate the Catholic church. The Catholic church, and today, like you said, we're filming on the day of all saints, is those who have been transformed in Christ. They are the saints. So if our perspective, when we look at the Catholic Church and our eyes, I always kind of think of, you know, ab above the horizon and below the horizon. If we look below the horizon, we see a bunch of guys in purple zucchettos and red zucchettos and the Vatican this and the Vatican that. And that seems really important, but it really isn't that important. The true importance is above the horizon where you have Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, second person Trinity, his mother, the Theotokos, the Blessed Mother, all the saints. And they're calling the shots. Are they allowing horrible things to happen? Is God allowing horrible things to happen on earth? Yes, he is. But ultimately, everything that we need as humans, as Christian believers, is provided from there, the fountain of grace. Mary's praying for us. The saints are praying for us. Jesus is interceding for us. He's giving us the grace and everything we need along the way. So our faith is not really in any of these men at all. It's part of the Catholic doctrine that they exist and they communicate the sacraments to us, but they do not turn it on and turn it off. And if we were in a situation like the Catholics were in Japan for over a hundred years where they didn't have any priests, you would continue to be in communion with Christ. Christ would continue to be the good shepherd for you and give you what you need. So that's an important perspective is to see capital C church is not clergy. Capital C Church is the assembly of the baptized anchored in heaven with the saints. So that's the first thing. And then practical things, you know, people say, well, should I stop giving money? Should I start writing letters every week? Um, should I start hounding, you know, my bishop place to place? I think there's a place for that. I think it depends really on your own bishop and your diocese and what's happening. You know, if I were in D.C., uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be pretty crazy. I'm not in D.C., but, you know. I don't think that, you know, what's going on with McCar McCarrick and Whirl and his replacements and all kinds of crazy things in D.C. But in general, in our personal lives, I've been saying, pray the rosary every day, like Our Lady of Fatima said. Read the Bible every day. Pray as a family. Go to Mass together. Uh, celebrate the feast, not just by going to Mass, but have some fun. Um, pray. Stay connected with Christ. It's just the basics of a rule of life, of being a Christian. You know, having mental prayer, making visits to the Blessed Sacrament, going to confession every two weeks to every month just to keep things clean and keep the books, you know, settled. Just your basic Catholic living is what's most important. And if any of this is taking away from that basic Catholic living, like, well, I'm not going to go to confession or I'm not going to go to mass or I'm going to give up on the rosary. No, that you're on the, the devil is getting to you right? His plan is working out for you. No. Honestly, since this crisis has broken out, I have been more inspired to pray the rosary, to pray for the Pope. My wife too. You know, we've been, you know, we, we pray the rosary at night, but to pray more, um, to share more, we need to. I mean, we're in a crisis. So we've got to double down in our own piety, our own lives, our own rule of life and get close to Jesus, you know, stay warm by the fire. Um, even though there are some bad ministers out there. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking to Dr. Taylor Marf Marshall and he's sharing uh, some insights into like, how do we go forward? What's the, what are some of the next steps? Please go to taylormarshall.com again to learn more about how to subscribe to his podcast, uh, subscribe to his uh, video channel on YouTube, as well as go to the new St. Thomas.com, new St. Thomas.com to be able to sign up for some courses and, and grow in your faith. 
One thing that I, I think about, uh, Taylor, is uh, the weapon of the powerless in the scriptures is fasting. Mm. That uh, fasting and even doing penance uh, on behalf of a sinful church can be a powerful means of clearing away the blockages, uprooting sin, right? Penance as part of the sacrament of reconciliation, going to confession. Penance is all about uprooting the causes of sin. And I feel like that that's a stream in our tradition, our spiritual tradition that has, without real question, been de-emphasized uh, after the Second Vatican Council. And I feel like it's one of the ways that we get off the fence. When I remember, you know, in first Kings, you have the prophet Elijah facing the prophets of Baal and the people of Israel in the middle. And, and his question to them is how long will you straddle the issue? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. In other words, you can't sit on the fence any longer. You really have to make a decision with whom will you stand? And I feel like in our own personal lives, uh, upping the game, right? When it comes yeah. to family prayer, praying the rosary and fasting, things like that that can remain hidden are definitely the undergirding, the, the core thing that we can do. When it comes to external and visible things, I think it's time for Catholics to, <laughs> how long we straddle the issue? Are you an yeah. American who happens to be Catholic? Or are you a Catholic who happens to be American? Yes. And if you're a Catholic first, if that's your fundamental identity and your true home is in heaven, well, then you know what? Step up. That's right. Go to your priest and say to him, Father, please, I want you to know, not only do you have my permission, but I'm begging you, teach us about yes. the church's teaching and sexual matters. Talk about natural family planning and the evils of contraception. Please talk about natural marriage as between a man and a woman, and that gay marriage is a lie. Talk about same-sex attraction and help us understand what the church actually means when they say it's intrinsically disordered, subjectively disordered. There is no way to flourish if you act out of that desire. There's no way to 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 cleanse it in a way then you can act out on it and it's going to lead to life you will not flourish if this these are the things these are the kinds of things that you know i want to hear i want yeah. I, I want my kids to hear them from someone other than me right and if they're not hearing them from my priests yeah. on sunday Preferably from the pulpit yeah please please like give a homily on this stuff right so yes. uh, these things are all woven together right and, uh, you and have that's one you know one of the things you say what can we do and it relates exactly to what you're saying is sometimes we as catholics and in, in especially right now have to move parishes now a lot of people are going to disagree with me and say no god puts you in that parish that's where god wants you to be maybe so if you're a 45 year old single man but for you and me when we have little ones and little ears, it is part of our vocation to make sure that they remain Catholic, right? We got 18 Absolutely. years of them. And so if we're in a parish where heresy is spoken from the pulpit, liturgical abuse is rampant, it's going to affect our kids' faith. And so we might have to drive an extra 20 minutes to find the priest who says those things. Or when he consecrates, he's devout, he's reverent with the species, you know, the divine host, we might have to, you know, go to an Eastern Catholic church or our family attends uh, the priestly society of St. Peter, FSSP approved Latin mass uh, because the preaching is so solid and the confessions are solid. You know, there's no wishy-washy, you know, as a man, as a father, I need a priest to challenge me in the confessional, you know, hold Absolutely. me accountable, hold the fire to me. I need that, you know? And uh, it's like having a good boxing coach. If you're, Boxing coach is lax. You're going to get knocked out when you get into the ring. I need a priest who's going to really hold me to it and challenge me to become a saint. And so I think that's another practical thing we can do. We need to ask, is my local parish and my pastor and everything that goes along with that parish, is it providing what our family needs? Or do we have to drive the extra 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is, to go to there to have a better formation for us as parents, but also so that our kids see authentic Catholicism? Yeah, amen to that. I know that uh, I know in our, in my own life with my wife Carrie and our kids, we moved. We literally moved yeah. in order to get closer to a Catholic high school that emphasized Catholic identity. Yes, and I mean, really, that's that's the extent that we went in order to to do that. And 
for our younger kids, we actually pulled three of our younger kids out of a Catholic school to homeschool them. Why? The sadness was, it wasn't that they didn't, you know, they weren't exceeding uh, academic standards. There was, these are precious moments in the early stages of our kids' lives. And we wanted to make sure that in those very, very moldable years that they were being molded in faith. And so we felt like we're the first primary educators of the faith. We can do a better job. And so we'll, so that's what we did. And, you know, I say that out, I said on the radio, you know, it's yeah. Like, yeah, okay. That we, we literally know families that were part of our faith community that moved to another part of the country to, to get away from not just, you know, drive 20 minutes. I mean, move, you know, uh, six hours to, yeah. to get to a part of the country where they can raise their kids and not have a battle on every street corner exactly. on in every and coffee it, shop. Like you said, if you're a Catholic first, that makes sense. I mean, if, if you live in a community where the groceries are always a little bit rotten and the water is a little bit tainted, you're going to have to move. You know, you can't, you can't spend the next 20 years eating that and drinking that. And it's the same thing in our church. Unfortunately, um, it, not every parish is the same. Not every parish is equal. Not every priest had the same formation. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, we do have to move around and find. I, I wrote an article several years ago at taylormarshall.com called The Great Catholic Migration. And I said, now and in the years to come, you're going to see Catholic families making these great migrations too, just like you did to schools, to churches, to states, to cities, where the Catholic faith, diocese, where the Catholic faith is held. Mm -hmm. People actually migrating because of Catholicism, because there are certain areas in the country that are pretty much scorched earth, dead. You know, you can't find good schools. You can't find good parishes. Yeah. It's an exception. So. Well, and I think about this as uh, you have to discern your call. Right. So my wife and I, we, we still live here. We didn't move. We, because we feel called to be here. We feel like, okay, you know, stay salty, my friends, right? There's the yes. motto on your website, taylormarshall.com. And it, we're called to be salt and light. And it, it does mean that we are going to face a more prophetic challenge to stand up and, and be a light and speak truth boldly, but lovingly. Uh, but at some point, again, I definitely respect parents who discern, you know what, why would I leave my kids in such dangerous, toxic places? I need to take more vigorous action to lead, guide, you know, and protect uh, and provide for my family. And, and if, if I discern that that's what I need to do, well, then we'd, we would do that too. But we haven't. You know, we're, we're still here for now uh, in the Seattle area. Not an easy place to, to raise kids. But on the other hand, you know what? It's, it's really clear. You can't really straddle the issue any longer, right? That's right. It's funny. I, I'll finish up on this point that uh, when I was growing up Catholic, I was in the seminary in the late 80s. And, you know, this was a time of real prominence of St. John Paul II, the new evangelization leading to the great Jubilee of 2000 was a time for St. Mother Teresa. And I was like, man, it's like, what a great time to be Catholic. I wish I, you know, I wish I lived in a time that was, it was clearer, really. It was clearer where you're either with the Lord or you're against him. Mm. Little did I know what I was <laughs> Your prayer, asking for. Prayer kind of oh, I, I long yeah. for the I long for those uh, those easier times, if you will. Uh, but I, you know what? I really don't. I, I really don't. It's like God planted you. We don't get to choose. He we don't put get us to here choose. now. And us being a saint is not like oh, I wish I could be a saint like Saint Therese, or I could be a saint like that. No, you're a saint now. Every saint is unique. And, you know, the reason St. Athanasius is St. Athanasius is because his vocation was to fight Arianism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't to be the little flower. He had a different call. And, and every single one of us, you know, people don't have my vocation. They don't have your vocation. They have their vocation. But we have to live in this time. And it, honestly, one of the hardest parts, I'm a convert. I was so proud of becoming Catholic. One of the hardest parts right now is the embarrassment of being a Catholic of people saying, oh yeah, I heard about what's going on in your church or your cardinal did this. And it's sort of the mud gets smeared on me. Yeah. And I, I, that's the hardest part or with family members who maybe didn't like the fact that I became a Catholic and they're like, yeah, your church isn't working out so great. Is it look at all those perverts in there. 
good job on that. That hurts. That's a hard part. Talk about penance. Yes. Well, and so my, my final word is we need to pray for our priests that are true to their vows, living a celibate life, striving to be holy, that they would be protected and that the Lord would truly raise them up to, to be strong voices today, uh, to really shepherd us, to, to govern us and teach us and sanctify us. Uh, fathers, you know, we want you to know we pray for you. We do. We pray for our priests. We pray for our bishops. We, we are looking for those good shepherds uh, because it is such a desperate time. So uh, well, Dr. Taylor Marshall, again, I want to thank you for being generous and giving me so much time today. Please, again, folks, go to newstthomas.com. And again, that word saint is all spelt out, S-A-I-N-T, newstthomas.com, to learn more about the various degree programs that, and cert- certification programs that Dr. Marshall offers there, as well as go to taylormarshall.com to subscribe and listen to his videos as I have. Uh, I've been listening to them and it's nice now because I can actually walk around uh, and just listen to even your YouTube yep. channel. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's great because of and all if that. You're, you're if your listeners go to taylormarshall.com, there's a free book, Thomas Aquinas in 50 pages. So if they want to start Catholic philosophy, just get a taste, 50 page primer, uh, taylormarshall.com, free book called Thomas Aquinas in 50 pages. Just a great way to get started on this stuff. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. Did you guys, did you hear that? A free 50 page, a downloadable ebook yep. on uh, Learn St. Thomas in 50 pages. That yep. is, I'm, I'm in. Yep. <laughs> I'm in. Yep. Thank you so much, Dr. Marshall. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you so much. God bless.